Please help me welcome, of course, uh, Nick Kroll, John Mulaney, and director Alex Timbers. So this show uh, is about two old friends in their 70s, right? Uh, have known each other for close to 40 years now, uh -huh. right? Right. So is that how much does that parallel real life? Like, I know you are not that old. Mm -hmm. I couldn't find your birthday online. I, uh, I have no birth certificate. I figured that. <laughs> yeah. I was a foundling. Mm -hmm. uh, we met when? 2000? Yeah. At the turn of the century. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> And it's now 2016, and yes. I'm not great at math, so I don't know how long that's been. It's uh, 19 years. 19 years, yeah. 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 We met in 2000 in college, and we have been best friends for 16 years. Yeah. Oh, college, really? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. We met. I was a, a senior at. Uh, we were. We went to Georgetown, and I was the uh, director of the improv group. And then uh, John audition. <laughs> <laughs> improv. John, uh, John audition, and uh, I immediately uh, fell in love. Yeah. <laughs> So how did you two get together to develop the characters of Gil and George, these two wonderful gentlemen on the screens here? Well, it started with an opening at Thursday nights at this club called Rafifi on East 11th Street between 1st and 2nd. It is now a Buffalo Exchange. Uh, we were, Nick was hosting a stand-up show with Jesse Klein, mm -hmm. correct? Correct. All right. Then she was, I kicked her out or something. She, she went to go, uh, she went to go write uh, for a show in LA. She and so I, uh, I, I asked John if he would host it with me and we were trying to figure out what we, what we could do or what would be a fun way to host it. And um, we were at the Strand bookstore one day, which is a... Uh, do people know the Strand? It's, uh, of course. The Strand is uh, 18 miles of books. And 12 miles of loneliness. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so we were there and watching there were these two older men, uh, both, both buying their copies of uh, Alan Alda's biography, autobiography, Never Have Your Dog Stuffed. And uh, they, true? Yeah, yes. they, <laughs> they both bought their own copies, and then we followed them to a diner where they both sat there and read their, their individual copies of the same book. And we were like, these guys won't share a book, but they probably share a Murphy bed. Yeah. <laughs> they had a real Bert and Ernie vibe, and they were turtleneck and blazers. Yeah. You know, they were, they were all, they were all it was, fabric. So it was the kind of guys that I think both John and I have been interested in for a long time. They're all over New York. Yeah, uh, they, these were like the batch. Okay, like the bachelors in a Woody Allen movie. Oh, right. You know when someone's like, I want to introduce you to this great guy, and then it's like a blob of corduroy. Yeah. <laughs> but the but the movie in the reality of the movie, this guy's a catch, and he's yeah. like an architect, and he has hair like oatmeal. Yeah. And you're like, in what world? And so it's like, imagine those guys twenty years later. Yeah. Uh, and and they're so they're just it's they're they're just like it's tote bags. It's like it's men with tote bags. It's men and. Now not like cool hipster, like a uh, little jean short Brooklyn boy tote bags. We're talking like broken pen, stained <laughs> yes. tote bags and like chipped PBS mugs. <laughs> Guys with their own individual grocery carts. Yeah. Uh, those yeah. little pulley carts yes. that then collapse and you hang on the wall with a bicycle. Yeah. So the oh hello, sh oh hello, the, the Broadway. If you want 40 more examples, we'll <laughs> yeah. I was, if you want. You want to know anything else about these types yeah, of guys? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like Their hand liver spots. Yeah, they, 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 were, yeah. They, they think the sun is good for you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they lay out in Washington Square God, Park. God, I just was in Washington just Square saw Park. These guys. I took Jesus. a picture of a guy in, in Washington Square Park the other day. It was sunny. And I got a picture of one guy with a big Jewish star right here, and it just was like a color of like a beautifully rotisserie chicken. Like, <laughs> and then there were a couple guys behind him who had the full tinfoil thing with a weird like mouth guard, because he was like, he had paper My lips. lips can't get burned. There's something like that. He had paper, he had paper lips. lips. Oh, like Einstein's like like heroin addicted brother. Yeah. I'm Jerry Einstein. Yeah. My brother, you know, I'm not my brother, you know, but yeah. I'm a good guy. Yeah. I repair keyboards. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's exactly right. So the oh, oh Hello on Broadway is is a show within a show that contains Do you need more examples? <laughs> I've got more questions. Yeah, great. All, right. All right. Well, we'll find a way to wedge them in. <laughs> 
okay, so can you explain the premise behind the Oh Hello on Broadway show? Because the show, okay. the show that contains okay. the it's a money yeah. grab. Yeah, it's a cash grab. <laughs> the money's in legitimate theater, everyone. Yeah. Get out of tech now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's about to be a live performance boom. <laughs> Uh, so I play a character named George St. Geegland, and he is a writer, okay? And this is a play, he's written many plays with his dear friend Gil Faison, who is a great actor. Sure. Right? Charmed him. He's also a potato stand-in. He's a stand-in for mashed, mashed potatoes. Potato. <laughs> yes, he is. Uh, so, they, so they have written a play about... They've written several over the years. They've written several plays over the years, um, and this play is about them losing their rent control department. Yes. Um, and they've been paying uh, $75 a month. For a five bedroom with office and fireplace and crown molding on 73rd. Yeah. <laughs> and their rent is being raised to $2,500 a month. The most money they've ever heard of. Yeah. And, <laughs> and so they're, they're losing their apartment and, they, and, and then the play unfolds and then and sort of the relationship between George and Gil, the, 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 the men who have written the play, uh, starts to uh, collapse upon itself. Yeah, there, are, there are cracks in this facade. If you can believe it. Um, but Alex might be able to explain it better than us in a more theatrical <laughs> way of putting it on the spot. Did we explain it all right? You did a great job. Thank guys. you, Thank Alex. you so much. I think what's also useful to know is that so, so much of the show is scripted, but also a lot of it is improvisatory. So every show you see is like different from every, any other. I was going to ask that later on, because uh, I've seen this Thanks show. Thanks for fucking that we up, jumped Alex. Jesus Christ, Christ, man. Jesus Christ. We talked about this I mean, in the car. I mean, why couldn't you give an example about what kind of guys they were? Yeah. <laughs> That's what he's looking for. I was going to ask how much is actually scripted versus how much you guys are trying to make each other crack all night, because it looks like all of you are just about, both of you are just about to, to laugh throughout the entire thing. Yeah. <laughs> And sometimes it's sometimes I will try to do things to make Nick laugh. And sometimes we look at each other and I think we just realize that we're on Broadway. And this, <laughs> I really mean this. This has happened a couple times where we look at each other and then we realize what we're doing yeah. and where and yeah. we both start laughing. Yes. <laughs> and sometimes the joke we've done a hundred times, I'd like to say like every time I crack it's because like we're improvising something new that I've never heard. but. Sometimes it's just, like it just makes me laugh. Like John will like like I'll be staring at d describing the shelving unit, and I'll look over and John <laughs> is looking at the shelving unit. He's just like, <laughs> <laughs> and uh. I, it's like I am not a professional. I don't know. <laughs> You know, that, you know, few people can hold up under that. Look. Yeah. <laughs> so we, so there, there is lines that are always evolving and changing, and, and we're improvising within spots. And then we have a guest every night um, that we it obviously is an improvised interview every night, and and then uh, and then there are other sections. And and Alex did a very good job of, of creating a structure that is really a play, and that we've worked hard in creating a real play that is that we've written but always leaving pockets for us to sort of walk away and come back to things so that it, it feels fresh to us and feels fresh to the audience. Because um, you want everyone to feel like whatever night they're there, that they're seeing something specific to that night. Mm -hmm. and, um, and luckily, because we really cannot remember our lines, <laughs> you are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but there are a few core relationship things, uh, and for this next sentence, I'll win the Pulitzer, that, w that you didn't want us to undercut, I think, in a good way. So we, we, we try to honor some things about Gil and George that we would, right. not, uh, we would not try to laugh through, because it's that, a serious play. Yeah, I think there's a heart to the show. I mean, because there's a sort of meta-narrative, which is the friendship of these two characters, but also Nick and John's friendship. And mm -hmm. I think by the end, it both really pay off. And, it's, uh, and so it surprises you, because it's a, it's a tough-edged show, but it has a sort of warm heart at the center. Yeah. Well, what about the, talk about the journey of, of the show itself, because it started out as, like, there was a Too Much Tuna sketch, and there was the Oh Hello show, and then it went, you went to do things in LA, you were doing things at the East Village, then it went off Broadway, now it's on Broadway, like, and then when did Alex get involved? What's the joke? Okay, so the actual Rafifi show on East 11th I was talking about started 10 years ago. So we've been doing them 10 years. I'd say it laid dormant. It's older than YouTube? 
Is that possible? Yeah, a lot of things are older than you, too. I know. Yeah. And look, Oh Hello's a billion dollar business. <laughs> In 10 years, In 10 we've years. been able to yeah. lose In, money. Yeah. <laughs> and just 10 years later, we're at a company that started after us at some weird picnic table. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Nick and I have both gone... Is this where you guys save the money on the phone? Yeah, <laughs> this is it. Is this what it is? Micro kitchens in every room and yeah. a fucking... Yeah. <laughs> but thanks so much for having us. <laughs> and we do, we feel this is, and I'm not pandering, we, this is one of the best search engines. In America, no, for real. I'm not kidding. In America, if not, no. Top if five. not the world. Top five. Honestly, great search engine. It's a great search engine. I mean, and George a, and Gill are Alta Vista heads, but yeah. Uh, and we're Bing boys till till, till the day yeah, we die, you know. obviously. Obviously. Obviously, Bing Boys. But yeah. um, the original question. Yes. <laughs> okay. So Nick and I would 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 often go work on separate things, but uh, I'd say this lay dormant maybe for probably no more than a year or so when Kroll Show started up. Yeah, we right? had. Uh, yeah, it was probably longer than that though, because I moved to L.A. and you started working at SNL, and we sort of put the guys. Eight, yeah, we yeah. put the guy. They, they just there wasn't a real venue for them. And then when we when I started doing Kroll Show, I was like, we should do Gil and George, and we tried a few different formats of it. Some more like little Woody Allen filmic pieces, and then also a prank show that they made called Too Much Tuna, which was sort of like their Manhattan public access show, yeah. uh, where they prank people with too much tuna fish, <laughs> which still doesn't make a lot of sense. Yeah. <laughs> um, what do you mean? What? what do you mean? <laughs> what, 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 How does it not make sense? I mean, <laughs> there's always too much tuna. There's almost too much. But it's funny. It, you put it in front of people. Yeah, it is. Imagine. <laughs> I mean, imagine you someone put a huge tuna sandwich, sandwich in front of you yeah. and acted like you ordered it. Yeah. It's very. It's, it's very a funny, funny thing to do. Um, tuna's very funny. It's really funny. Tuna fish salad, by the way, is what we mean. With mayonnaise. With mayonnaise. Yeah. yeah. Um, Shorthand tuna, but yeah. please know we're talking about tuna yeah. salad. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we, we did it on Kroll Show, and it weirdly, like we were always told like, oh, this works in New York, it won't work anywhere else. And then it weirdly, it sort of took off and became one of the more popular things on the show. And like we had like 15 year old girls in Phoenix dressing up as George and Gil for Halloween. So it was like, oh, this this is expanding yeah. beyond the. Yeah, it had a Slender Man vibe where people <laughs> everywhere. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, and so, uh, so then we, um, so then we we did a in conversation with a, on the, at the 92nd Street Y, which you can watch on YouTube. YouTube. Um, YouTube. Yeah, YouTube, and. Uh, <laughs> And that was like that was to promote Kroll Show season three, and it was super fun, and it was like 900 people, and we improvised for like an hour and a half with Willie Geist, and and we hadn't done them in front of a live audience since 2007. Probably. Yeah, it had been a really long time, and it was so fun. And afterwards, people were like, "Well, what's next?" And it was like, "Oh, oh, hello on Broadway." Yeah, oh, hello on Broadway, <laughs> and as a joke, but then like, oh. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So we then, it was like, well, let's just go to Broadway. And people were like, you don't, you, you don't, you yeah. can't just like go to Broadway. Yeah. <laughs> hey, I'm here now. Yeah. 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 Um, knock, so knock. we then, so then we, we set out to like write a show. Um, and we booked a theater. We booked a theater. We booked a Cherry Lane we had theater to write for a like show. end of November, at, right after Thanksgiving. And so then we started writing a show. Um, Early and then like started in end of August, beginning of September we started. <laughs> it's yeah. so crazy to think. It's that. really, it was really dangerous how we did it. Yeah. yeah. Um, but and this year. Of no, last no, no. year. Uh, Before, uh, so we booked yeah. the we booked the Cherry Lane Theater. Let's start say it was like November 26th, yeah. and so like September 1, we started doing. We started like we had like a 10 page outline, that we then would take on stage and improvise and, and build built the play that yeah. way, writing it It was the way. most like a vaudeville show of anything I've ever done where we had like 10 years, we had like a trunk of bits from 10 years and we would sort of sprinkle them wherever and then try different, you know, threads to the show. 
and um, we arrived on an early incarnation of what we have now. And we, and we, Alex was kind enough to, I had met Alex a few years earlier uh, and have been a big fan of his work. And on a sort of a lark, we were like, Alex, would you be interested in being involved in this like truly stupid thing? <laughs> um, and he was sort of like, yeah, that sounds great. Uh, which was a kind of a shock. It was really sort of a surprise to us that he was interested. Um, and so we would send him tapes of what we were doing in LA, and he could start to get a sense of weighing in and weigh in where he could and wanted to. And then we had like a crash course at UCB for like three or four nights before we went to the Cherry Lane. And then at three, I mean, how long was our tech? It was like two days. <laughs> How long is tech normally? Usually you have a rehearsal process where you decide what the blocking is going to be. Uh -huh. right. And then right. there's a set uh -huh. and lighting. And I think the first time we all sort of got together was the beginning of tech. And we were like, you could enter through that door or that door. And you guys were like, we'll enter through that door. And, and then like the next night you were in front of an audience. Yeah. <laughs> it's crazy. You kept telling us like, hey, this is great. By the way, this never happened. <laughs> and we were like, OK. Yeah. <laughs> but it was, so at that point, Alex brought in, started to get very involved and brought in his team of, of lighting and sound and, and music and, and choreography and all these people who all of a sudden coalesced with us on a very brief, fast run, which we then sort of honed over that Cherry Lane run about a, a year ago. And then we toured the show um, this winter, uh, like January through March in, in like four or five cities. And, and then... Um, and that was kind of nice because it was the Cherry Lane is uh, it was on Commerce Street. It's about 200 seats. We started going to places in like San Diego that were you know, like much bigger venues. And we realized like, oh, George and Gil feel comfortable anywhere because they feel entitled to everything <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> so they're fine playing a big house. Like they're, they're comfortable in that type of thing. And that was a nice... Uh, that was a nice build towards Broadway, where you're like, once they get to Broadway, they're not going to be thrown because they truly believe they deserve to. Yeah. Be. <laughs> and then we uh, then we came back to New York for rehearsal, and this was like, oh, we actually are now rehearsing in that in this building where like uh, the front page is rehearsing with like John Goodman, Nathan Lane, John Slattery, this amazing cast, and also we were next to. I'm gonna. I, I can only say Go the for it. Said in English. The, the dangerous liaisons. Les liaisons. <laughs> with Le Liev Schreiber. Schreiber yeah. And it was we, like we us in We shared a bathroom. Bay. Yeah, we shared a bathroom with Liev Schreiber. Yeah. Um, he didn't know, but we did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You were watching the whole time. Yeah. yeah. And we're in one room being like, we need more tuna fish. And yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but it was fun. It was like little. It was like it was like Broadway college. It felt it like we were all like rehearsing together, and and then we started our. Run. And Alex, by the way, assembled like some of the both like most talented and nicest, most fun people to be around. I think. Yes, I think you you probably have deliberately picked amazing people your whole well, career because the I people would, you brought in. I would were, hope so. Well, sometimes you're stuck with a bunch of jerks, you know. I guess. But uh, you had a. You had and have an amazing group of people. Yeah, so Alex, you, you, your credits include like Peter and the Starcatcher, right. Bloody Bloody Andrew Jackson, like some serious Broadway things, sure. and then as Nick said, like this stupid project that you've taken <laughs> on. What, what made you want to take it, and what's it like working with these guys? Well, I think uh, what I loved about it was immediately I was, I was fans of these guys for a long time, and uh, I, I believe that like when I saw Tommy when I was growing up, I was like, wow. Theater is not an elitist thing. Theater can be in dialogue with the mainstream. And, uh, and it felt to me like having like alt comedy on Broadway is a really sort of exciting opportunity. And you see it in the audiences that are coming to the show. It's like way younger, way more diverse. And I think it's the sort of thing where if you came to Broadway and this was your first Broadway show, you might be like, oh, there's a place for me in theater. Or, like, or theater is a place I might go back to see another show. Um, and I think what's cool about these guys is, as they said about the team, the people that are working on it are nice, but it all comes from the top with these guys. These guys play assholes, but they're really kind and collaborative, <laughs> and uh, and so th that's been the whole experience. And along the way, we brought in like some you know incredible people, like multiple Tony Award-winning set designers, these, like the greatest puppet designer uh, uh, <laughs> in North America has built like an extraordinary puppet effect involving tuna fish. So it's it's just been it's it's like a lot of a lot of like artistic firepower aimed at like. Total stupidity. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's, um, 
uh, Ad Rock from the Beastie Boys was a guest on Too Much Tuna and said one of, I think one of my favorite thing about the show ever afterwards, he said, uh, what I like about this is like this, you know, like we all have ideas like that, you know, they're, they're fucking stupid. Like, you know, you have ideas and you're like, oh, that's so funny, but that's, that's too fucking stupid to do. He's like, you guys like, you like did that idea. <laughs> It was like the highest. It was like ever. the highest praise <laughs> like I ever the heard. Dude, right. Like the All dude, like the dude who made sabotage. Yeah. You know what I mean? You're like. And Mike Birbiglia also said he's like, this is the most expensive joke ever. Done. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, it's like you're doing a show about the M&M store, making fun of the M&M store inside the M&M yeah. store, and you guys also love M&M. Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, Too Much Tuna, that, that segment of the show every night, mm -hmm. for those who don't know, you bring up a different, well-known person, different celebrity every night. I was there uh, on Seth, uh, Seth Meyers' night. Oh, great. Nice. Um, which was, which was, was very great. funny. Yeah, so how do, you, how do you pick who comes up on stage? And is it, and it's obviously, is it improv the whole time, or is mm -hmm. it a rough script? No. We have like a whole, we're, you know, through personal relationships and otherwise book all different types of people. And, and our goal is to have not only people like Seth Myers, who are friends of ours or, people, you know, in the comedy space, but also people um, who would either be in George and Gill's world in real life, like Robin Bird, who, <clears throat> for people who grew up in New York, and some of the men are quietly chuckling. Uh, Robin Bird hosted a show on Channel 35, Channel J, like a public access like show that she would have strippers and porn stars on, and and but has been on TV for since 1977. And it's like if you don't know who Robin Bird is, it's like Google her and you'll see something that is so yeah. deeply and specifically New York. Um, and she was amazing, and she was just like truly yeah. a joy. We want people that are well known, but we're also going for people that would would most kind of jibe with Gil and George's world, mm -hmm. who they would be most excited to talk to. We had Marsha Clark on the show in Los <laughs> Angeles. Mm -hmm. We've had Ira Glass, Dick Cavett, like people they would have a lot to say. Yeah, about. like for, former uh, Commissioner Kelly. Com yeah, yeah, Police Commissioner, Commissioner Ray, Ray Kelly, Kelly did the show, the best, yeah. who was like a beat cop on the Upper West Side as his first oh, gig yeah. and like probably busted George and Gil for smoking a roach outside of his yeah. Zabar. You know? <laughs> we started to explain the characters, and he went, oh, I know these guys. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> um, And then we also have, like, Alan Alda was our opening night guest. Yeah. And, like, our guys, again, it's like for us to have the guy who, when we used to explain the show, we would be like, there are Upper West Side older guys, they're obsessed with Alan Alda. And, like, it, like, kind of locks people in to know what kind of guy we were talking about. Yeah. So to have Alan Alda as our guest, was like the culmination of a crazy amount of, of just, it was just this confluence of things and really amazing. Yeah. And, and then he just hung out with us backstage and was amazing. And he had done plays and we had photos of him from the Schubert, you know, the yeah, Schubert, the Schubert archives. archives are in the uh, top floor of the Lyceum Theater where we are. And so we had gone through and seen old playbills of early stuff he was in, like the apple tree. And it was just amazing. We got to talk to him about all of that. And we improvised with him on stage. He, you know, people don't realize that he was a <laughs> trained improviser at the Compass Players, which pre, like sort of predated Second City. And so we improvised on stage. The three of us. Uh, he was like, "Well, I improvisation is about support, and and you know, whatever your the other person is saying, that you you support it and, and move it forward. Yes, and kind of thing." So we improvised. So it was like, "Well, let's improvise the scene together." And so I I said, "Hey, Alan, let's kiss George." And he, perf without missing a beat, goes, yes, let's kiss George on the ass, and you go first. <laughs> <laughs> and it was like a perfect improvisation on his part. Right. And it was amazing. It was truly like, it was kind of like, if, if the show had closed the next day, I would have been like, we did it. Yeah, we did it. <laughs> a 10-year insane journey yeah. ending in a beautiful conversation with yeah. Alan Alda. Yeah. <laughs> So being in the Lyceum Theater, uh, a lot of the jokes in the show revolve around that actual space. Did did you write it? Did you write the jokes once you got in there, or did you specifically seek out that show? Whenever, wherever okay. we've been, Cherry Lane or on tour, we're all, George and Gil are very aware of the space they're in, and we always wanted to write to the space we were in. And we were um, familiar with some productions that had been at the Lyceum. Alex obviously uh, had seen a lot more, um, so we just started thinking about. 
uh, how they're, I mean, we also had Scott Pask, I guess. It mm -hmm. started with that, our, our amazing set designer, putting mm -hmm. together a set cobbled together from old Broadway sets. <laughs> are they are, actually? They're the stored from a weird Some of them are. The, really? the, the Steel Magnolias is, is an actual piece of the set, or no? The I Am My Own Wife is. I Am My Own Wife is. Yeah. So Those are the grandma. We have, we have a bunch of stuff, and then there's pieces to the set that we were like, you know what? We, we, I don't know if we're going to use Ed Koch's grave. Like, which is originally a part of the show. <laughs> which, if you have a second, go Bing. Um, <laughs> go Bing. Uh, uh, <laughs> People. <laughs> oh, it's a fucking joy. Go, uh, <laughs> go um, Bing or go home. Yeah, this. yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but, but honestly, go just uh, yourself. Um, <laughs> Uh, yourself, uh, uh, Ed Koch's grave. It's, it's, it's so weird. Because it's back in the show, and people always go, "Why'd you write all that weird stuff on Ed Koch's grave?" And, and it's like, like no, no, that is Ed Koch's grave. grave. It's, it's got a Daniel Pearl quote on it, um, which uh, hilarious. I'm like, I don't know. I'm like, it's so funny. You know that beheaded journalist. Um, <laughs> But it's also it doesn't have his born in death years. It has the years that he was his mayor of New York. Date. Oh wow! It says Ed wow. Koch, like 1984 to 1989. Yeah, yeah. It's, <laughs> it's <laughs> mayor of New York. So yeah. anyway, there's stuff like that that like Alex and Scott, our, our set designer, were smartly. We were like, ah, we don't need that, and they were like, no. It. The real goal was like, if we're gonna do a Broadway show, it's got to feel like it belongs on Broadway, and so that's been again one of the things Alex has done beautifully is. Maintaining the like low s shittiness of George and Gill, yeah. while also presenting uh, something that feels like it should be on Broadway, that feels like it, it has the scale to um, polished garbage. That's yeah. right. How do you like? <laughs> how do you balance the lo-fi quality with a couple like coup de theatre? Yeah, you know yes. that really right. surprise people that Gill and George have that kind of theatrical know-how. Yeah, hmm. they do. They're not, they're not here to play games or make friends. No. But John, you actually created, you were a writer, you created uh, the character of Stefan with, with, with Bill, Bill Hader. Hader. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, so do you prefer now being uh, on stage in the spotlight or do you like the writing room a little bit more? I like playing George St. Geegland more than anything I've ever done. <laughs> uh, I love doing stand-up second most. Um, I love writing. I don't just like to be out there. I like to do specific things. I like to do stand-up, and I like to play George. Uh, and as of now, that's, that's about it. But I re no, I wasn't always like, oh, I want to go do a worse version of Stefan. Uh, but with <laughs> George St. Geegland, it was like, oh, no, I, I, no this is me. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, it's kind of doesn't it's not that jarring for me to do this because I've been doing it for ten years. If I was suddenly um, in like the pajama game tomorrow, that would be <laughs> odd. Um, and that reference brings down the house. And <laughs> yeah, but I, this is this like stand up feels very natural to me. Hmm. Um. <laughs> not satisfied. <laughs> yes. Uh, no, I really like, I mean, like, but with SNL and this, I was like, live, like, hard jokes in front of a live audience, that's the best thing. I've really enjoyed this Broadway experience more than anything I've ever done professionally. Yeah. It's so fun, it's so bizarrely, for these two pieces of garbage, it's so bizarrely glamorous. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's like what I always thought show business was. Like, I wanted to be like Ricky Ricardo, I wanted to go do my show mm -hmm. at night and then come home and, like, just be, have my day free. And, Have uh, your wife like in blackface? Did <laughs> she do blackface? I, I, I would assume at some point, right? <laughs> it's a major accusation. Yeah. yeah, you could be sued by Desi Lou. Yeah. <laughs> so this is definitely not one of the low points of your career. No, this is. I just said it's the yeah. best. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It uh, is the best ever and uh, still a low point. Yeah. <laughs> and Alex, do you want your next thing to be more of a, a classic Broadway? I mean, what are you working on now otherwise? Uh, the next thing I'm doing is uh, a show with David Byrne uh, about uh, Joan of Arc. So it's like a rock musical. With your... So nothing like this. I'm hoping one of these guys will play Joan of Arc. Yeah. <laughs> Auditions are tomorrow. <laughs> John just said he'd help out. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, Nick, so what are you working on? Are you working on anything else at the moment? 
Uh, yeah, I'm 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 doing an animated show for Netflix about um, growing up, going me and my friend Andrew Goldberg from childhood, uh, who ended up a writer at Family Guy. It's about uh, he and I as 13-year-old boys going through puberty, or in my case, not going through puberty. <laughs> and actually, John vo voices the role of Andrew. Yes. Um, it's called Big Mouth. It'll be out <laughs> next year. Um, and it's uh, really fun and dirty. It's like perverted wonder years, basically. <laughs> um, and animated. And cr but very sweet. Yeah, it's got a real They wrote an extremely sweet show that also has things that make my fucking jaw drop. They're so dirty. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's like me and, and John and Jason Manzoukas and Jesse Klein and Jenny Slate and Jordan Peele and Maya Rudolph and Fred Armisen. And uh, it's a crazy, crazy group of people who are throughout the show. Um, and then I'm, I have a movie called Loving that's coming out uh, in, a, in a couple weeks. Um, which is just like Oh Hello. It's the tr uh, it's a historical drama about Richard and Mildred Loving, who were an interracial couple who got arrested for being married in Virginia in the 1950s, and then brought their case to the Supreme Court overturning the ban on interracial marriage nationwide. Um, just like Oh Hello. It's a laugh a minute. Yeah. <laughs> well, and you play Gil Faison. I play. Uh, <laughs> that's the only way I do it. Um, they're like, they're interested in you for this movie. And I was like, who, what am I going to play in that? They're like, it's the ACLU lawyer named Bernie Cohen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I could, I could swing that. <laughs> uh, but it's, it's a really, this Jeff Nichols directed it. Um, it's a beautiful movie. Um, so I, I, I encourage all you guys to go see it. It's, a, it's not, unlike most historical dramas, it's quite understated and beautifully told and shot. It's, it's a really cool movie. Hmm. Um, well, we're, we're going to start taking... Another, take hmm. Yeah. And I have my own Sully coming out in 2018 <laughs> that I would avoid. It sucks. Yeah. I didn't do a good yeah. job. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. Hey, there it is. That's a new hum. I like the new hum there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. We're going to get into audience questions, so if you have any questions, please line up at the mics here. Um, and while people line up... Oh, wow, look at this. I'm going to uh, pass out two whiteboards, and because I didn't have three, someone will get a notepad. Who wants the notepad? I'll take it. Okay. All right. All right. Um, all right. All right. I do walk. like that our first question is coming from someone with headphones and takeout food. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. It's not Thanks. takeout food. I actually brought you guys tuna salad sandwiches oh, no. <laughs> to make you feel like Let's see. Bring it up. Bring it up. Bring it up. Better be enough. Oh, uh, thank you. Hmm. This is the great joke, though. This is, this is, this not is what we call anti-humor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's a commentary on it. I would argue that this is genuinely not nearly. <laughs> you must have confused us with the assholes from Too Much Bread. <laughs> Your question? I do yeah. have a question. <laughs> My question is, um, what is most alike between you as actors and you as your characters? Um, well, in the play, there's a couple things. One, someone described it to us as like, oh, oh, hello is like you guys doing who you really are inside, which, and that is like, Nick is a baby and John is an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so we are playing some Deep inner, down, some yeah. inner id. Um, and then I think it's like, I mean, I personally think we are, um, I don't know, I think our dear friendship and love for one another comes through in, in the relationship of George and Gil. I think that, that is, that these two guys are, um, that they're really dear, dear, lifelong friends. Um, the only thing that's hard is that George has to intimidate Gil. And I've, I've, I met Nick and he was like, he'll always be a senior and I'll like, be, you know, like he'll always be intimidated by him. So that's kind of like the one weird thing. Do 20 push-ups, jerk. All right, fuck. <laughs> I'm a man, I'm a man, I'm a man. <laughs> Come on, get up to the microphone, you. Hold on, I, I want to do, do a whiteboard question real quick. Right. Um, what is, so, by the way, what is explain this? Explain what that is. Well, yeah, yeah so I'm Don't pretend everyone knows okay. your thing. All right. <laughs> Nobody knows my thing. I'm, I'm going to explain it. Mm -hmm. um, so I want you guys, we're going to play a little like version of newlywed game with the three of you. Oh, uh, great. Uh, okay, so there's my explanation. Thank you. 
You, uh, but answer as your characters. Alex, you answer as you would expect. As one of their. Oh. As one, one of One of, the, yes. Oh, yes. Okay. So, you still carry a tin lunchbox from the 80s to work every day. Who's on your lunchbox? And it's, sorry, we're not guessing it about the other person, it's just about ourselves? Actually, yes, we should guess about the other person. Oh, that okay. would be the newlywed game. And, that would, and, and just, just to be clear, um, I'm guessing what George would have on his thing or what John yes. would have on his thing? What George would have. And I'm guessing what, what Gil, Gil would have. have. Yes. And, what's, what's and I'm this? guessing and just... Either one of them. Okay, great. Yes. Okay. okay. We will get imaginary There's a place. reason we wanted an explanation. <laughs> okay, great. All right. What would George have on a... <laughs> you have 10 seconds. Okay. All ready? Yeah. And one, two, three, reveal. Cast of Dynasty. <laughs> <laughs> the famous cartoon character, Michael Gross. Michael no. Gross played the father Probably. on Family Ties. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> yes. He was great, too. He was. He's a good actor. And he is, you're right, he is like a Gil and George. Like that oh, liberal, very much He's so, like a liber yeah. that liberal, like hippie 60s guy. He was also in that play Art, which I feel, yes. he, when it was in Chicago, he was in Art, and I feel like that was a big, a big uh, watershed moment for Gil and George. And for and Bernie Getz, I don't know if you young millennials know who uh, Bernie Getz is, but he's a dear friend of Gil and George. Yeah. He's the guy who shot four people on the subway. He was known for like three days as the subway vigilante, and then he, he stepped forward and they realized he was just like a... Turn of the narrative. Yeah. Yes. A weird racist in a members only jacket. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Allegedly. <laughs> He's a litigious guy. Mm -hmm. Question over here. Hi. Hi. I'm wondering if you think YouTube has been an overall benefit to or detriment to comedy and theater. Oh. Ooh. Oh. Ooh. Uh, <laughs> in the belly of the beast. Yeah. <laughs> it's been a benefit to it's been a benefit to comedy. I think exposure is always good for comedy. I think that yeah. I think that like YouTube and 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 I would put podcasts in a similar regard. And that woman just clapped for the word podcast. <laughs> um, the man. That, um, she's, she's a podcast teamer. Yes, yeah. that's great. Yeah. Um, and blogs. <laughs> um, I think it's it's about the democratization of comedy and and content in general. Um, and so I think there's a great utility that. All types of people could have their sketches and video seen and all types of stuff. Um, and, and it just allows a lot more people in a lot of different places to see stuff. Whereas like 10 years ago, when we started doing our characters, we were desperately trying to get into the Aspen Comedy Festival, which was like a comedy festival that's where all the managers, agents, and industry people would go to see your act. And if you had a sketch show, that's where you could get a deal to like get a to go do a show or whatever. With the advent of YouTube and podcasts, like all of that, like that, like ivory tower shit and gatekeepers became irrelevant. Yeah, um, it really ended the the year we tried to get in. They said this is it's a young festival and you guys are playing old men. Yeah, and we were like peace. Yeah. <laughs> it ended that year. And it was that was the last year of it. And so it really felt like and, and I think YouTube had a major and and a lot of the other stuff. I think it's like it's amazing that. There are uh, friends of ours who are super talented people who maybe not ha are household names can build a following on, on, on YouTube or on podcasts and go and play really great theaters and venues all over the country because they've been able to uh, build a fan base. What do you, um, think? Oh, sorry. What so do you think about theater? Isn't I think it? it's a double-edged sword because I think for writers and performers it's great because you get your material out there in the same way you guys are talking about. I think the thing that's tricky for designers and directors and choreographers is uh, if you're doing a first class production, say you're, so you're doing Wicked and someone films it, and then someone else wants to do Wicked, you can steal copyrightable material from that. And so you see a lot of replica productions of professional productions where normally you wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't be able to go to a theater and transcribe all the blocking that they're doing. So that's, that's kind of where it becomes complicated. Is that um, blocking is like trademarked? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Wow, like dance steps. Yeah. Because it's officially part of the, the finalized show. It's like writing or something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Wasn't that fun to watch someone learn something? <laughs> what a wonderful world. Yeah. <laughs>
All right, another whiteboard question here. All if right. you could pick someone from history. How about a white guy question? Yeah. <laughs> Isn't it time? Isn't right. it time we had our chance? All right. Here's a white guy whiteboard question. Yes. If you could pick someone from history already dead ah. to have as a guest during Too Much Tuna, who would it be? Oh. And are we on. still answering this for yes. George? Like, there's there's only changed. one question. I want to answer. Is there? <laughs> <laughs> he just wrote down a bunch of stick figures. Oh, man. Um. Okay. All right. Show him. <laughs> hey! Okay. I like Bob's Bob Bob tweet. Yeah. It's the original Ed Yeah, that is the original Ed Koch. Yes, there you go. Yeah. yeah. That damn Tammany Hall genius. And these guys are the bosses of Tweed. Yeah. yeah. That's not funny. And yeah. <laughs> Question. Yeah, thanks so much for coming out. Uh, I saw the show a few weeks ago, very funny. Um, there's a lot of like very specific theater references. It's sort of like a, a satire on theater. Also just uh, caught up on season two of Documentary Now, which uh -huh. John, I know you wrote on, uh, which I've heard described as like a loving parody or like a loving satire, which I, I think also kind of fits with Oh Hello. Mm -hmm. um, and I kind of wonder what your approach is to do like a parody or a satire, but that's also uh, very loving and not, not in a mean spirit. I, I never think of when people are like, oh, with Documentary Now or Saturday Night Live, I'm sure with Kroll Show and Oh Hello, people are like, oh, so you guys are taking down blank. And I'm always like, no, like, <laughs> Not at all. Like we can like parody or uh, name check or reference things that I'm just like, no, it's just we're just saying them and emulating them in a funny way. But I have very I mean, sometimes uh, we were just like on, on SNL. Sometimes we're just making fun of something. <laughs> but for a, a lot of stuff I've done, like we did this whole Spalding Gray episode and People were like, oh, you're like taking down Spalding Gray. And it was like, no, I'm the biggest Spalding Gray fan in the world. It was so fun to get to do an insane version of that type of thing, right? So I think with Oh Hello, like, we're, we're again, we're in the M&M store making fun of the M&M store, but we love M&Ms. But also, just to be clear, regular M&Ms suck. Yeah, no, uh, pe <laughs> peanut m and &Ms are the yeah. only M&Ms worth having. Which I didn't have till I was 30. Peanut M&Ms? I never had them, yeah. Oh, John. So much fun. Uh, yeah, I mean, we, we like we say in the show or have said in the past, like it's a love letter to Broadway, but or more realistically, a stalker's note written in lipstick on a mirror. Yeah, we're like guys who are too in love with certain things. So when it comes out of our mouth, you're like, hey, easy. You know? Yeah. <laughs> and again, it's like bringing in Alex and his team of people, and like you know, we're, we we love theater and, and plays, but also there are things about it that drive us crazy about it, and and. There's a way, I think, to celebrate it without n without mocking it and, and being inclusive of it. And um, yeah. that I think that's the goal, is to like, make stuff. Yeah. We have a lot of jokes about Steely Dan. And I see them every year at the Beacon Theater. Yeah. Like, so everything is kind of kidding and deadly serious. Mm -hmm. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> All right, whiteboard question. If we were to look at Gil and George's Google search history, sure. what would be the most frequently recurring term? Ready? Yeah. Oh, God, I'm bowing out of this one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah! <Hey! laughs> Only difference is, and this is the difference between George and John and Nick and Gil, is that his are in quotes. Oh. <laughs> Someone knows how to search. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, question. Hi. Um, I want to learn to talk like Gil and George. Is uh -huh. there a manual? Uh, we have a podcast that we're doing about podcast. it. Uh, yeah, podcast. Uh, it, yeah, it's um, that's actually a good example of they don't they wouldn't say podcast they would say podcast. Podcast. It's the bury, bury the first syllable. Bury the first syllable of everything, or but not like Jim Stewart. Jim Stewart, you know, limp shade. Yeah, uh, there's that. Change O's to soft U's whenever possible. And then also turn anything like A U into an A R. So it's or the audience. <laughs> yeah, or, yeah, yeah. Or, or, or. Or, or. <laughs> Add ours wherever you want. Uh, bury the first syllable in this space, but then also bury a d 
com. Yeah, MySpace did yeah. com. Yeah. YouTube did com. So I guess it's on the one and the three. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> like German. Like, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like class. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the YouTube. Like, we, uh, we didn't, I, I, but we got a lot of people saying, like, Trump, like, in the. He the said cisfire. He said cisfire. Yeah, and they like, should be an immediate cisfire. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, hello. Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh hello. <laughs> How does that, does that help? <laughs> <laughs> okay, white guy question. Yeah. Nice. If Gil and George were running on the same ticket for president, what would the cam campaign slogan be? Mm. <laughs> You're <laughs> bowing out. <laughs> I would say, oh, hello. What's that? Read them out. Oh, read them out. Read out what we've said. The last one was feet. Both yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> Bill and George both liked feet. And before that, they would want to prank Ed Koch. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Can you read them out? What's everyone laughing about? <laughs> Okay, ready? Yeah. All right, you want... All right, is this their ticket? Yeah. Yes, yes. Oh, my God. Come, Come on. on. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. Please. Please. Come on. Hey. <laughs> or their, their campaign to women. Why don't you smile more? Yeah. <laughs> Very effective. <laughs> You're so beautiful. Yeah, gorgeous. You're so gorgeous. gorgeous. Why don't you smile? Smile more. more. Yeah. Come question. ride Subway with me. <laughs> Pocket. I got a question. <laughs> um, do you guys just think this is so funny that it's like been the same thing for 10 years, or does it evolve at all? Because I feel like uh, I feel like if you've been doing the same thing for 10 years, it's either like you just fucking love it and you think it's the funniest yeah. thing in the world, or it's like I'm yeah, finding new yeah. nuances to the character. Um, <laughs> We. <laughs> that was like, like a not. You seem like a wonderful guy, but I had like slightly bully energy. Like, <laughs> hey, do you guys just? Uh, do you I'm think raise the mic, but it's funny like, yeah, that you've been doing this for ten years? <laughs> <laughs> My answer is yes. <laughs> That's uh, honestly made me laugh a few times. That it's, it's just on stage, I'll look over at you and you're like, <laughs> and I'm like, oh my God, we've been doing this for 10 and years. I, but uh, you know, there, there, are jokes that, there are jokes that are in there that we have been doing for 10 years and there's nothing else that I would ever do that I, I would never do another, I would never do a stand-up joke for 10 years. Yeah. Um, there are jokes in there that we've been doing forever and then there's also stuff that we are learning every day um, about about the guys like uh, like we it was like I don't know if it was in a rehearsal or on a, the run through when we first got to the stage that like that uh, we realized that Gil Gil's father ratted out other Jews during the Holocaust. <laughs> that came out during an improv. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's fun light stuff like that, <laughs> but. It's like there's new, like you've got 70 years of stuff to learn. And so it's, there's, that's, and that's really been also the fun of theater is when you make uh, TV or film, like uh, you have, you, you, tr you write it, you do your best to write, write it and then shoot it right. And then you edit it and hope you can figure it out. With, on stage, it's the same thing. And then it's, it's like Groundhog Day where you just get to keep. Yeah like each day learning more and more and trying to get it more and more interesting and figure out if you can make Andy McDowell interesting. And you guys have discussed also <laughs> continuing to do it until you actually become Gil and George, yes. right? Yes, yeah. that is the goal, is to do Gil and George until we don't have to wear makeup. So we go like, this isn't funny. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you guys even, you put on liver spots on your hands. Yes, you think yes. Our, our, yes. My wife, who is our amazing makeup artist, really makes us pretty gross. Yeah. <laughs> and every, every guest who comes up on stage is like, What's, what's wrong with your hand? Well, Jan Oliver yeah. uh, from <laughs> Loose Week Tonight with Jan Oliver, he was on the show and he was like, you don't understand how ridiculous it is to look you guys in the face. <laughs> <laughs> and at one point during his interview, I said, Gil, you have a question about Israel? And John Oliver started laughing and he said, I knew I was going to have to turn and look at Gil. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> and that he would then start talking about yeah. Israel. <laughs> <laughs> but um, with like how much stuff now you're like people want new content and people like you know is stand ups you like burn your hour and never do it again and have an hour every year like it is so funny to do what is like truly like a vaudeville thing where yeah. like I'm like I've said this joke a thousand times but tonight I'm gonna say it a little differently to make myself laugh yeah but it's very weird but it's sort of reverse liberating. And I think your fans love hearing some of the same jokes and now actually getting Yeah, it has like it is like old music. school vibe. And yeah. and that, and I will blame YouTube for this. Um, <laughs> there the the only problem with it is how hungry the internet is. It's voracious in its appetite. And so you constantly as comedians feel like you're con you have to constantly be putting out new content where years ago you would just hone your act, go make your show, and you'd be able to, or you'd go tour it for two, three years and then put it out. But it's such a hungry beast that like, and that's what's one of the fun things about doing live theater. It's like, yeah. no, this is the you show. You gotta come see you it. You gotta come see it and experience it live. <clears throat> um, and for a very unreasonable price. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to which Googlers have the discount. Yes, 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 yes. yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> What? Maybe. Yeah. 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 Um, would you ever consider like the final performance, recording it and putting it up on the Netflix? Uh, well, I think we're our goal is to make make something for posterity. I mean, yeah. like for mm -hmm. it to live in some other format, some other way beyond like the Lincoln Center VHS archives. Yeah. <laughs> but I think it is. It is. I mean, I think for sure, like we we've worked really hard on it. It would be great to have it seen somewhere, but. Um, there is something about the live experience of it mm -hmm. that is, I think, un unbeatable. Do you like watching shows on tape? No, it's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, but like filmed versions. Yeah, I, there there aren't that many that are great that you wanna that it's you so feel hard, like. Yeah. Someday you'll have the Oculus Rift and you'll be able to be with Mandy Patinkin, right? Right. That's the goal. Stage. That's the yeah. goal. Yeah, Mandy. The goal Mandy's is the goal. always to be with Mandy, Mandy Patinkin. Patinkin. But I want to be an Oculus Rift in an episode of Chicago Hope. <laughs> the really are. Yeah. I mean, you could have said, no, it won't hurt my feelings. It's fine. OK. OK. Yeah, one more question? Yes, uh, John. So you've d done both stand-up and also been a writer for SNL. Yes. What's your process for coming up with jokes, other than observing old men at diners? Mm -hmm. uh, so I feel like in the past couple of years, I've had to get more disciplined. I was lucky. Uh, when I was younger and that, I, I don't know, I just could like, I had more free time and less on my mind and I would just kind of walk around and think of bits and I was kind of lucky with stand-up stuff. A, a lot of early stuff kind of came to me like semi-fully formed or I would just think about a whole run or a whole long joke on a walk or something and then try it that night. And um, in general, it's still a process of like, trying stuff that night and I have the benefit with stand-up as does Nick that we can just go to a club and work on stuff that night but I have now had uh, at the at, now at the end of my life I found <laughs> <laughs> like I just can't my brain is like uh, preoccupied with other things and I really need to make time to to go okay I'm going to the comedy store tonight I need to think of jokes now that has positives and negatives about it uh, I miss the like fertility of like, I'm just this dude walking around, but now with some responsibilities, it's harder and I need to make time for it. Um, so I've had to carve out like, think about comedy time. Um, whereas <laughs> I used to have zero life and no friends and thought about comedy all the time. What, what is you, what do you like carving out time look like? Are you like sitting in a chair? I'm sitting at a desk with a notebook and no computer. Uh, and I try to do it for, I read Philip Glass's autobiography and he had these like three hour horrible sessions where he just would sit at the piano and he was not allowed to get up. Like couldn't go, you can't go get a snack, you just have to really sit there. And at the end of the three hours you could have written nothing but you have, and then you get up and you're so happy. But like you have to sit there with nothing else and I found that that does work because I almost, I hate writing so much, uh, and I almost am like, am, I'm like, well, I better entertain myself by thinking of something, because this is so boring. <laughs> so the displeasure of my own company outweighs my, my dislike of the creative process. 
I hope that inspired millions of children. <laughs> That by 34, you'll be brain dead, and you'll have to force yourself to do the thing you love. Yeah. <laughs> As you watch this on your computer, uh, instead of doing whatever it is yeah. that you're supposed to be doing. My God, though, I still love talking about comedy so much more than writing it. It's yeah. crazy. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. So before, uh, <laughs> we're almost out of time here. Before we go, I would want, wonder if you guys would be nice to explain to us how we make a, a one-sided phone call, which was one of my favorite bits of the show. Oh, the one-sided phone call. Do you need mm. a prop? Uh, sure, I have my phone. So. Not that I don't want to use your phone. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> Not that you don't want Google all over your phone. Yeah. Um, but, so, I'll, as George St. Geeglin would say, the one-sided phone call is when a character makes a telephone call but they do it in a very stagey way where they repeat the phone call information out loud to everyone else on stage. Mm -hmm. So Gil will now show us a one-sided phone call. Mm -hmm. Oh, hello. <laughs> uh, Sergey Brin? <laughs> That's who you are. <laughs> uh-huh. You love too much tuna. <laughs> you love this Google Talks. You want to give us a Project X? <laughs> <laughs> you gonna try check out our blood sugar by putting a fucking contact in our eye? <laughs> and pay us enough money to you know, <laughs> get a micro kitchen. <laughs> All right, we'll we'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much. Uh, visit, visit the show online, Oh Hello Broadway. No, visit the show. Come to the real show. <laughs> but he's helping us. You got to go to the you gotta, gotta go gotta, to Broadway. No, oh, no, oh, hello no. Broadway. People like come. to line up and buy physical tickets. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, Alan. I was just, I, I don't do know. You, I was just trying to read, get a laugh. You wanna, no. You I'm can, just, you can say so it. desperate for a laugh. Mm. Oh, hello, Broadway.com. Uh, John at home being like, I got to write today. And he's like, I got the joke that I'll do at the end. <laughs> 7 a.m. getting up thinking of Alan Burns. <laughs> <laughs> so the show was in a limited run until January 8th. Get your tickets now. See it now at the Lyceum Theater, 149 West 45th Street. Uh, at, ho at Hello Show on Twitter and Instagram. Uh, everybody help me give them another round of applause. Thanks.